Welcome to the D&D Fitness Radio Podcast, brought to you by your hosts, Don Saladino from New York City and Derek Hansen from Vancouver, Canada. In episode 44, we speak with legendary strength and conditioning coach, Al Vermeil. Hey, Al. Al. Hey, how you doing? Al, how are you? Al, I met you a couple times. Um, heard you speak probably years ago at a TPI in San Diego. I probably okay. heard I probably heard you speak maybe a, a, at, least, at least a half a dozen times. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's great. I to, apologize. It's, no, you were amazing. So it's great to have you on, and we really appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, I uh, I thought it'd be great to have you on, Al. And just, you know, there's a whole bunch of things we can talk about. Don and I are all over the map. Well, that's um, me. <laughs> I'm H-A- hey, whatever they call that, you know, no no focus. Hey. You mean, I have it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys will get along perfectly. Uh, um, perfect. But uh, just for background sake, like some of the things I want to talk about was even the conversation we had uh, – I think it was a number of weeks ago and you talked about how you looked at players and uh, how you kind of screen them for lack of a better word and said, okay, this guy has these abilities or this guy's deficient here. I thought that was pretty cool to hear that. Um, and then Don has a, a significant background on the golf side. So you guys can talk about that as well. And even the baseball side. Okay. So, you know, when we're talking about screening and of course at my age, I've already forgot the conversation. I probably forgot it the day minute I put the phone down. <laughs> Uh, I make new friends every day. Uh, the big thing we, when you looked at, the first thing is, and I think everybody forgets in these screens, and I don't want to say I'm an originator because that's not true, but no one ever asked, and Don, the same on the golf side, can you play? Yeah. So if you get some guy that walks into golf, you're going to screen him. What's your handicap? Well, I average scores 130. Good luck. Forget it. Go do something else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you got to be realistic, you know, and it's like basketball or football. I and mean, they would, you know, and football, when I was there, they had this rating system. This guy was 9.22, and this guy, if you're talking about, let's talk about football and basketball. If you're drafting a defensive back, you better, a defensive player, my first qu- question is can he tackle and how many does he make? Well, he's a cover guy. You still got to tackle the ball carrier, and if you watch the Super Bowl, you'll notice the teams that get there generally are the better tacklers. Hmm. A very basic fundamental: if you want to win football games, you must bring the ball carrier down. Pretty simple. <laughs> and in, you know, other words, can they play? The same in basketball. We would get guys that would bring us, and I won't. Some people would bring us these guys, and, oh, if he works with you and you can make him bigger, stronger, quicker, faster, you know, more, you know, other words, first of all, the person was a non-athlete and he couldn't play. So the first question you want to ask anybody, I don't care what sport's involved in, can you play? It's no different in academically. If you've got an 85 IQ, I don't mean, I'm not demeaning those people, but you're not going to go to MIT. So if your athletic IQ is and your play playing IQ is very poor, there's nothing you're going to do training them is going to make a difference. And that's the first thing. There are no super miracles. And so can they play? Then you look at look at their frame. Cuz I just I've just done a couple of these different podcasts or whatever you want to call them and we we talk about adaptations. You get a player like uh, B.J. Armstrong was about 6'4", but he had a 39-inch inseam. So you couldn't pull him off the floor where Horace Grant could. So you look at their frame. We would warm them up. Now, some people don't believe in warming up people because they say that's not a fair test. Well, if you're going to go hit the long, if you're going to go out and hit golf balls a long drive and you don't warm up, you're you're going to be in the PT clinic right away. So I think you have to warm up people before you test them. I, I I just, what is the state of the body when you evaluate them in their athletic performance? They were warm. So we'd warm them up and we'd do the running drills. And that was, you know, we'd do a few of them. That was interesting. You could see a lot about the rhythm and coordination. And then we did a, uh, 
as we did the overhead squat. Now let me t let, let me talk about this. Can they play? The next thing is, what's their speed? If you've got a guy that can play and run fast, you know he can jump high or she can jump high because right. there's a correlation. Uh, obviously, the squat jump is the start of the sprint. The counter movement jump a little further. If you have a, a drop jump, because Carmelo and I were personal friends, or you do repeat jumps with no knee flex, that translates out to further and more absolute. So can they play run fast? My next test would be can they overhead squat? And at the bottom of that, can they bring the bar up and down? So if you, you pass those first three and you par, pass part B of overhead squat with a press behind your head with a stick, you don't need to test any more flexibility. You don't need to test any more mobility because you can't get in that position without hip mobility. You can't get in that position without dorsiflexion. You can't get in that position without extensibility of the glutes and quads. You can't press and you can't get there. You definitely can't press it overhead without great thoracic extension and shoulder mobility. So why go do 42 other tests when this tells you at all? I got a question for you on that, not to, not to jump in, but I, I, know through, um, you know, I know through FMS standards, they like a shoulder width stance with their toes pointing forward. No, now, no, I have, no, yeah, no. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, now no, I, no, I know my, my, my hips don't allow me to do that. I, I've got to, no. I squat wider, I squat with my toes out. It's just my structure. Well, here's the first thing. In testing, it has to be the I let the individual adapt to the test. You don't see any two, three people all the same. So if you're going to make a test where everybody's toes has got to be a straight ahead and, and feet a certain space, you've you've already biased a test to certain people to get a certain result. Mm -hmm. You've never seen an Olympic lifter whose toes aren't turned out ten degrees. If you look at your hips, I got to stand up here. I don't know if you, your hips aren't orientated this way. My good friend Jeff. Coverly, who is a wonderful physical therapist in uh, on Pearl Street in Denver, your hips are orientated this way, right. so you 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 you've taken the internal rotation and made it worse. That I I know the people that do it. I know Greg Cook. He's a great guy. I have a lot of respect for him, but I prof professionally disagree with that. What's so, his argument? What's his argument? On I that? don't know. I, you know what? I don't get into what every. You know what? I've never gotten into what everybody else does that way. I look at something. I say that's good. No, I don't agree with that. Why don't you? So I go find people who know the body better than I do. And who? What sport other than? What's the only sport that you really squat overhead for competition? It's a, it's a snatch in Olympic lifting. My son was an Olympic lifter, trained by Yuri Vardanian, Dragon Mercer Rosian, Dick Smith out of York. You know, I, you know, I've been around a lot of really good coaches. And you never – if it wasn't a benefit, if it was the correct way to squat, their toes would be turned out. So I don't like that. The other thing you never see them do, you never see them take the second part and do the press part. Because you can't cure that instantly. In other words, you, there's people that can overhead squat but can't get down and do that. So there's no instant cure. But again, I think the FM, uh, the screen is good. I'm not saying it isn't. I would just modify it. That's, and the width of the shoulders, I would take the width of the bar should be about six to eight inches overhead. Or take your fingers and put them this way and where your elbows turn, hit the end of the bar. That's generally where we used to get a starting. And you have to modify it. Yeah. Okay. You, you can look on, call Mike Katona. He's great. He's the Olympic lifting, uh, in the Olympic lifting. And again, you adapt to different things. Carl Miller sent me a whole thing back in the 70s when I was with the high school. I brought him in then in the 49ers for different leg length and body proportions how you adapt Olympic lifting. So I don't think you can get a test and say, okay, I want you to squat a certain width. What did I tell you about BJ Armstrong already? No, everybody's going to lift off the floor. Failure. So I think you got to adapt. But in any way, without beating that too much. So if they can execute those three tests and you can do change of direction, well, you know they can play, so they should be able to change direction. Right. <clears throat> and... Uh, we had a little test that we would warm them up with at the Bulls, and I got it from an old high school football coach. And let's say this, I'm, my hands are below the stair, so I'd put my right foot on the stair, then my left foot, then my right foot, then my left, then my right, 
than my left. I can send you this, Derek, you can put it on your website. Yep. So we do three of those. Then we go left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot on the stair. Same stair, all the way up. Now we do three of those. Then we go right, left, left, right, and alternate. We've I found, now, do I have any correlation, matrix, Pearson formula with all that crap they give me? I don't, you know. I knew that guys that couldn't do that couldn't change direction. And my only thing I could figure out in my crude is that this, the connection to the brain, to the lower body, when we did our change of direction, we'd start here and had a light box. And I can send you that test too I got, Derek, you can put on. And so let's say the light had to go this way. It was two and a half meters. And I'd get the time out of the beam to the mat, foot on the mat, time all the way down, five meters, time on the mat, back to the middle, total time. And I just found people didn't, couldn't sense where they were. And I don't, Great Cook, to his credit, one day in a clinic many years ago to perform better, gave me the actual answer. He was talking about jumping rope. I wrote it down, and I couldn't figure it out worth a damn. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't remember, and I asked him, and he couldn't remember. So uh, you do your change of direction, and now in terms of testing, in terms of jump testing, we did Carmelo squat jump. I, uh, Don Chu and I initially started developing a timing device, and I finished it when I went to Chicago, and I, the second version. And you'd get in that squat. I, I didn't do it then. I put my hand on their chest, let that thing ring. It's not that important. <laughs> well, I know who it is, but I can't answer. Oh, I, love it. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. I got, let me shut the volume down so we don't hear it. Don't you worry. So anyway, uh, well, I lost my train. So it would set their distance. I would put their hand on their chest. Later, I met uh, Liam Hennessy, a great sports scientist out of Ireland, and he put their hand underneath their chin. So we do a counter. We do no counter movement. A counter movement. The the squat jump measures explosive power. The counter movement. You start to get some elasticity, but it's still explosive. And then at the time, we would do four jumps in a row. We'd take the height for the second, third, and fourth jump and the time on the ground and get an elastic, uh, what they call a re, uh, uh, reactive strength index. We called it an efficiency. And I actually, before the Australians did it, there's actually an article in the NSCA that where I was testing on game day doing it. So we'd look at that, and then we'd do a step close, and then we'd do a straight-ahead sprint. And when we looked at all those factors, then I start to say, like, I'll give you an example. It's an easy example. Horace Grant comes in, he, you know, and we actually didn't do that with him. We were just starting that. But as an athlete, he comes in, he's got the gasoline. I've got a cup here in front of me, and I'll try to show you how big that opening is. If I feel, and let's say that represents strength, so he's got a long ways to go. He can fill that cup up. But whatever strength he had, if I poured it out with an opening that big, it was going to come out very fast, this representing his nervous system, where I got another athlete where the opening was like an eyedropper. They didn't have the same nervous system. And they're older. It's very hard to, ch to change. So when I looked at Horace, it was, everybody said, oh, it must have been difficult. It was the easiest. He loved the train, great attitude. Pittman had a great attitude. His proportions were even. He could. He eventually could full squat. He, he could pull the bar off the floor. Well, I, I think, Horace, because I, 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 I've been hearing you speak for years, right? And, and Horace is someone that you always bring up. I mean, he's one of the guys that you well, really, really – Well, the, the reason I wanted you to bring him is then I'll go to the opposite. Sure. So, so he had everything. And when you have a great one, it's not complicated. Charlie Francis had Ben Johnson. You look at his weight program, simple, couldn't do plows because of knee. The guy's a great spinner. When you get those, I looked at Horace. I said, all we got to do is fill that cup up because he can use it. So all we did is pulls, squats, presses, power cleans, power, then for explosive power, Power snatch, power clean, push, jerk, jerk. And people's, and I said, well, you know, that in those days in the NBA, now it's changed. 
there was a lot more contact under the basket and they'd pull you when you go to shoot a shot and different things. And people said, why didn't you do plyometrics a lot with the bulls? I said, they've had plyometrics their whole freaking life. That's yeah. why they all got tenonitis. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's in one example. And he has a twin brother, right, coach? He, like he, His twin brother was Harvey. I can send you, I t- and this isn't me pumping my tires. First <laughs> of all, I, I want to make this very clear. People have been gracious to say very nice things about me. And one of them is a legend. First thing, two things. A legend is usually dead, so I'm not sure I want to be. <laughs> number, number two, I'm not a legend. The people I coached were. Yeah. The people I coached. Well, that's humble. That's, no, that's, that's the legend. truth, coach. Coach, coach. coach, everyone in the industry right well, now who knows anything about strength and conditioning would, would, would put you down as a living legend. Okay. Well, so that's fair. Well, anyway, but the point being, uh, it's like, you know, you're familiar with TPI. Yes. If you caddy for Tiger Woods, everybody knows who Joe LaCavo is or Stevie Williams yep. or the, uh, the gentleman now, the, I, I can't quite remember him. He used to come out of the mattress at, uh, and I think he still uh, caddies for Fury. Fluff. But if, fluff. But if you caddy for, and I won't give a name because I don't want to impugn anybody, but if you oh. caddy, no, no, I wouldn't do that. If you caddy for a guy that's won one or two tournaments, who? Huh? Yeah. yeah. It's who you were with. And now let's go to the one other thing about evaluation. Two other things. The Steve Javor complex is one of the best evaluators you can have. And people say, well, why do you say that? First, you've got to get in a hang position, an athletic position, position to make a tackle, play defense, play shortstop, somewhat similar to a uh, golf posture. Number two, you've got to pull the bar up here. Okay, now I'm going to look at that mechanism. I'm going to look at the shoulder. Is your shoulder going to come here? You can all, now I've got to do a muscle snatch. Okay, that tells me more about your thoracic spine. Do you sway your pelvis? Does your pelvis come way for it? See, none of the other tests these people do, they're not dynamic enough. Because sports is dynamic. Dy- sport is not a static hold of position. The other thing you got in, in Steve, you got the good morning, which really tells you about what they call a hip hinge. Squat mm-hmm. to press bent over row. <clears throat> so the other part is just training is a great evaluator. You, you start training people and you see things. Now, when I looked at another athlete who did not have the difference between the counter movement jump, who did not have a high reactive strength index, who was narrow shouldered and long legged now and not overly explosive, then what do you do with that athlete? What do you, how do you work with that one? And if you read Carmelo's and other stuff, people who have not dominant fast twitch have to go deeper to create the tension in the elastic to get going because elastic reactive strength is the most important quality you can have. It's because it's the hardest to train. And remember this, those people listen, the shorter the time to execute the athletic skill or the training method or exercise, the more it depends on genetics. Some people can accelerate, but the great ones now have that other gear. And what I'm saying is that's a shorter time to execute the skill. It's like everybody wants to do how quick their feet are, right? Right. Well, when Don and I developed this thing with the 49ers, we had an offensive tackle. And I could measure every second on each foot the number of contacts. And his feet weren't as good as mine. I spent a whole off season trying to get him better. I did the same with the guy at the Bulls and never improved him. I mean, I did everything. Hip flex, you know. And when we did a little observation, we found the hip flexors had something to do with it. But my point being, when you're going like this, the time to tap that thing is so quick, there's no time to train it. Think about it. Where I can train a squat because I got time. Cleans a little, Olympic lifts a little harder. Uh, really good jumps, a little harder. Absolute speed, harder. Mm-hmm. So that's why I, I, if train what they can do. So we we would take this individual, and we knew we could fill up the cup with some strength. The other thing is, we knew in jumping is that if we could cut his counter movement down, he'd be more efficient going up for rebounds. 
So what we did is pause push presses or push presses with a short dip. We did static vertical, uh, static stuff, stuffs, but we cut its depth down. And then we developed the Purdue drill, which is named after Will, great person. Will was wonderful to work with because he was highly intelligent, highly motivated, great guy. I learned a lot training Will. So what we did with Will, what he did, not we did, he would take the medicine ball from the chin, never allow the guys to jump with the ball, and we would test the guys with the ball here too, not let them bring it down. So he would jump up, touch the rim, come down, hold the ball overhead, touch the rim again, and on the third one, stuff it. And he could do that with a 4 or 5K ball. Wow. Well, he became very efficient because if you his vertical reach was, I think, 110 inches. So it, whatever that is to bend to get the ball over the hoop, let's say that's an extra eight inches. So he only had to really jump, you know, if he had 110 inch reach, the basket's only 120. So if he could jump 18 inches quick, he could get the ball down the hole quick or get it off the board quick. Because basically you're preparing that person for a 20 inch race. If you're working with a hundred meter man, you don't have him go run the 400. It didn't, he didn't have to touch the top. The other thing we did with, with what Will did, we did a lot of work from the mid thigh. What because what Carmelo say they want to take a little deeper flex and Joseph Tahani has done some research and and on the same and if so what we did with guys we would put the bar at mid thigh or the power position do a lot of work there at appropriate weight so they learn to use force in a shorter amplitude of motion motion and will eventually split clean one forty uh what was it uh two forty two one ten and that at, at seven feet was and he did it off blocks was really good. No, that's impressive. I, I I got a quick question for you. So it, it is combine week. So how would you actually do player evaluations? Like I'm sure you, you look at a lot of it and you just kind of roll your eyes to it naturally. I, I I don't know. I don't want to criticize them. They, 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 you know what the hell? That's I'm out of the. You know I'm long gone. My, before I don't uh, as a my critic, most important value, my post and five boys. Tell me if the guy can frickin' play. How come Montana was drafted in the third round? One of the greatest quarterbacks, him or Unitas, are now the guy up in New England. But, you know, you know, and I saw Johnny U play his rookie year. I saw him play. I saw the great Colts teams play at least three to four times, and, and the great Packer teams play three or four, at least one, yeah, about four times. And the game was different then. So my ask X for any scout to would ever come into me, can he play? And as soon as they go, well, but how's a guy like, I think my brother drafted Jared Allen in Kansas city. I'm not sure of this in the sixth round. And the guy was a great player. So I'm a testing can tell you physically what they can do, but testing can't tell you instinctively what they have for the game. I think this was you know, a guy I did one of these the other day. Ask what you learned from Charlie, and I went, duh, I went brain lock. Don't ever think they've disappointed you. You know, if you if I didn't I didn't always show horse those guys the program. I said go do this, and we'd go up just on how it looked or how it would go down. And the great illustration I always give of this, when I was coaching high school football, and it was 1977, I hired a gentleman named Jim Ingram. He had coached at Washington High School, and I lived down the block from it, and replaced the great Bill Walsh there. He'd been there many years and very successful. And for some reason, he wasn't going to coach football there for a couple of years, and I don't know. So he came to work for me. He said, "Let's, you've been going three a day. He said, yeah, let's go four. So we went four days. Couldn't do any of that today. The third day, the kids walked on the field coming out, and Jim said, look how they're walking. Al. I said, yeah, they're putting one foot in front of the other. You know, I'm 33. I'm a real genius at that age. He said, no, look how stiff they are. I said, if we put pads, if we go practice, we're going to get, took the pads off, did everything with no pads, kind of like a tempo practice almost. Next three practices were great, no problems. So you have to constantly adjust to what your eyes and ears tell you. And That's, uh, that's, I, that's, that's, coaching. that's I, coaching. Well, today we got GPS. GPS isn't going to tell you all that. You know what we did when I was the 49ers? I had a kid watch a wide receiver and practice and chart the yards. I had him go to a game and tell me how much time the ball was in play and the time between. I did it on the Bulls. I took videotape. 
We didn't have all that. But if the bottom line with all this, you got to be in shape. You can't be. You can't be in the fourth quarter on a twelve-play drive. Oh, they're tired. We got to take them out. Ah, uh-uh, don't work that way, folks. Or the last two minutes of a championship basketball game, or the end of you know any sports season at the end of the year, you're tired. So you've got to get them. And I think that's one of the things. And I don't know this. I shouldn't say this. I should back up. All I know. I'm surprised when I watch college football and see guys play six plays and have to come out of a game when you've got a, a ton of TV timeouts. Well, how about the basketball thing now, coach, where guys sit out games and, you know, we don't want to make, we, we don't want to, you know, tire them out or we get, it's a long season. You guys have six championships and everybody played, right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I thought there was one person I would have liked to have had him break in the middle of the season because I've charted and I knew when he was going to get hurt. And I always try to say, you know, why don't you leave him home on that road trip? We're going to win anyway. We're going to win the championship anyway. But, I, yeah, and well, that's the whole modern touchy-feely Sports today, everybody gets a trophy. Don't yell at anybody. He, you know, I watch my grandson play baseball, and a kid. You know, I've watched this for years. Okay, you're young. All right, good try, good try. Oh, they're 10, 11 years old. That's the third time the ball's went under under your glove, and that's not good try. Get the damn glove on the ground. My old co- Pete Tedeschi, my old baseball coach from little league, and a great man in Calistoga, played minor league ball. Is in fact his son. Uh, Ah, oh, not Larry. That's the other one. Uh, like all of a sudden we got a, got a, I can't, Freddie was our trainer at the Bulls and now at Oregon State with Jeff Macy. But, you know, he didn't go, oh, nice try, Al. The ball got by and scored a run. You know, Alberto, get yourself in position. You know, come on, come on. You know, we're, we're making sissies out of all these. They're, they're just making, you know, criticism is part of life. Right. And wait till this generation gets into life and find out everything doesn't go its way. It doesn't always work. You know, what are you going, oh, I want a crying room because a, a boss hollered at me. <laughs> and now I see, I see someone, oh, they're going to sue him because they, the, the boss, come on. Yeah. Come on, America. Give me a who break. Was, who, was the, who, was, who was the collegiate coach? That when I was like, I think it was the coach of uh, South Carolina, maybe like women's basketball team. But he, it, there was a really interesting interview where he was like, you know, everyone, everyone wants a trophy nowadays, and it's just oh, setting a bad. I don't, I don't. My son came to me. I, you know, I've got a ten-year-old boy, and, and I think two years ago, he you know plays hockey, plays baseball, and he was upset one day because he saw a kid on his team receive a trophy. It was like most improved, and he didn't get one. And it might have been even when he was seven years old. He was young, and I sat him down. I said, "Listen, if you want a trophy, you got to work for it." Well, not you know, you're not going to get a trophy, you know. And no. I, if you heard my brother Dick talk about my father, he was a he had a nineteen and a half inch neck and had a big scruff, you know, you know big man relatively for his time he told me one day i was so dumb i couldn't he did i'll clean it up i couldn't pour urine out of the boot with directions on the heel (laughs) and another time he says i got a boot to fit right up your i'll clean it up up your rear end and he said some other things i can't say on this thing but you know what when i got into life i understood it and uh my brother dick called me one day the biggest psycho he ever coached but so, you know, that's just, I'm just concerned about that. But that's, but in terms of getting back to conditioning, I'm concerned when I see that, I think we've allowed the football players to get too heavy. I don't, I, I would like to know their body fat, legitimate body fat percent. Uh, I, I, that's the thing. And I, I realize the game is faster and it's going to be more uh, physically demanding in terms of certain aspects of the game. I understand that. Uh, I came from the generation where we all play. If you were the best player in high school, you played both ways. And I played both ways before I played both ways in junior college for Dick. And when my brother Dick played football, the quarterbacks had to play defense. One of the reasons the old quarterbacks didn't get hurt, they were tacklers too. Tacklees and tacklers. And you could hit the quarterback. There was none of this roughing the passer, as United said. They never called it. There was none of this, oh, you fell on him as a penalty. And, and anybody that played football, and they guys will tell you today, anybody that plays the favorite guy to hit if you're a defensive player is a quarterback. 
And when he's like that, just stick him. I mean, that was just part of the game. And I'm not saying you want to hurt him, but that was just part of the game. And I, I've put this on Derek's website. And of course, I, it's the only tweet I ever gave because I screwed it up. But I, would, I went back and figured my own conditioning summer program. And I ran, now these weren't quality sprints. I would run about 35,000 yards of 50s every summer. I'd start with 10, five days a week, run, walk. Each week I'd add one or two, I can't remember. And the second set, and I didn't rest in between, Number 11, I would run, and then I would just take a easy jog, and then boom, run it back again. So I, by the sixth week, I was seventh week, I was up to doing 20 of those five times a week. Now, were they quality? No. But was I in condition? Yes. My high school kids, we, we got in condition. We ran uphill, downhill. We lifted. We did plyos. Don Chu was right up in the hill. We did plyos. We did complex training. And I said, Don, what if I mixed it too? He said, good idea. We actually stepped off bench. I didn't, I, my kids, my last year didn't bench. I said, what the hell? You wouldn't, you're laying down in football. You're in the, there's only one sport where being on your back's good. And I'll leave that sport alone. But uh, the, uh, so we would use our bench press benches to step off the bench and hit a bag because I had been a track and field athlete. The greatest thing that ever happened to me, being a track and field. And, and I threw the shot 54-9 officially in high school. In California, and even 1963, that didn't get me the state meet. But I was coaching myself. It was a little school, so I had a fool for a client. Um, but that gave me appreciation for track and field. So when I saw this book where the guy stepped off a bench and threw the shot, I said, let's do it in football. So we stepped off a bench and blocked the bat. And then we did a lot of what now people call deceleration training. We do all these different change of direction drills, and I had norms on them. I had picked up when I was a grad assistant for Vince Gibson at Kansas State. We called it the 32nd station. I figured out the kids changed direction, I forget, 1,200, 1,500 times in the summer with that drill. Every time you catch a clean and snatch, you're changing direction and jerk. Uh, every time we did a drill you had in football season or any time when we did a drill in a group, you would have to run to the next station, break down, move your feet, and then we'd give them a wave. If they didn't do it right or hustle, they did it again. Well, you do that training for four years, you know how to decelerate, and you're in position. Uh, many years after I left, one time I was talking to Don because we only had one varsity football player ever get knee surgery in six years. I had two on the other levels, three in six years. Now they're like every day. But uh, I asked him. And I said, was the training? He said, yes. But he said, your kids were always in position. And, they're, and you're, if you didn't play football, then you wouldn't know what it is. But there was a crowd or sled. There was a whole series of techniques, how you use your body and leverage. And if, if you've hit that and you've had to gather yourself hundreds, thousands, uh, literally thousands of times over the course of four years, you learn body control. So I think in conditioning is, are they too fat? Are they running enough? Maybe they are, but I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm concerned when I see that, that it doesn't look right to me. And you know, I, I, that I, you know, I could be wrong. And I'm not chastising the coaches. I just don't know. I, I've seen it with a, I've seen it with a, a couple of collegiate athletes where I, you know, we would see them during the summertime and they would come home and these were already big kids, you know, uh, you know, six, three, 275 and I said well what's your plan for the summer and they're like well my strength coach wants me to put on 30 pounds and I'm like 30 pounds like this is like look at your frame already you're you're a monster I get it I get what they're trying to do but I don't get it like you just there's only so much that your frame is going to be able to pump out and and at, at, at what cost I mean it's not it gets to a specific point where the human body the frame is just not healthy holding us always I always put this in kids. this let me put this in this perspective my father was a brilliant mechanic he did things with cars and that people then did years later he had like a tuned intake back in the 30s he did things in model a's where you have the intake manifold and you just start cutting it down until it ran best there was no computer telling him to do that wow. but i always go to mechanics if you have a car that has x horsepower does it go faster with an extra 500 pounds or an extra thousand pounds obviously so if you've reached your potential where any increase increases the body fat that does not generate any usable force, then that's the limit. 
where is what weight is their most usual? And I got a little heavy my junior year, and a little, and I had I backed it back down the next year. But you, uh, you've got to look at what can they handle? What's their power? What's their speed? Well, if you if you put twenty pounds on, and they're just as fast and everything is great, and they kept all the other factors. But if you put 20 pounds on and it's three or four percent body fat, then I don't. And I, I, they're all impressed with our defensive line weighs 320. Yeah, they play five plays and they're out of the game. You know, I think there's a point of optimum. Everything is it's training. Uh, I was talking about uh, Tony Kukoc was great to train. He was 6'10 and clean 110 from the hang mid shin. But I, I never. People said you take him more. I said no. I knew he could do more. It wasn't important. It was only important that I knew he wasn't wasn't an Olympic lifter. But he he so uh, again, it's adapting and understanding the athlete. And you know, we all make mistakes. Hell, you know, we all we've all got you know things that we we'd like to forget. I go back and look at some of the clips of our guys. I just never put that one on a clinic. You know, you're going to have to run out of town. <laughs> Coach, th this might sound like a really generic question, but you know when I was I, I boil on the other day and, and and Charlie Weingroff and we're all you know oh, some good guys, great great guys. You know, seasoned coaches though. I mean, you know, I'm in my 40s now, so you know, I'm, I'm starting to kind of creep where I've been in the industry 20 years and I look back on things that I would do or, or, or I'm doing a lot differently now. How does program design for you now? Like, if you were to do it now in comparison to maybe when you were, you know. Um, you know, with the bulls, like would it, would it have changed it at all? Like, how would you lay that out? But let me put something Rob Panarella sent me, he sent me a great saying from someone and I don't have it right in front of me. I might be able to bring it up on my phone, but he sent me a great saying. Basically your principles never change. My principles were get their butt in shape, get them stronger and more explosive. If you want to be explosive, you train explosive. If you want to be fast, you got to sprint. So my point on all that is I wouldn't train a lot, probably a lot different. I would be a lot better because the little details, the little things I did, that, there might be things I'd done a little more, a little less. I might have poured a little more red wine and spaghetti sauce and a little less of this seasoning. But if you were to go back, we'd be doing the same three strength movements, squats, pulls, presses, the Olympic movements, Jumping based on where they're at, where they're at. Do they need it? What's their body like? You know, speed work. What's their conditioning levels? And we used a lot of Charlie's medicine ball throws. We'd work up to 800. And I took one thing off the of Charlie. I call it tempo medicine ball. We'd have the guys throw 20 times, just easy at the end of the gym, stride the other end, just the game pace, which isn't as fast as everybody. I timed Paxson from the time the ball was thrown in and they got it and passed it, it was about five seconds and 18 yards. Not really fast. Everybody sees a fast break and they think it's that. Now the game, because the rules may be a little faster today, but we would do sets of those and we'd work up to 800 of those. So you do, a set of 10 different throws with a stride between. Uh, we did this 30 second circuit, you know, we, and we added an, a suicides at the end of it and a 90 second run. So we do two sets of those, but my principles of training would be the exact same. I wouldn't just because an exercise exists or it's difficult. It's like that fricking turkey should get up. Every I want every time I see someone do that, I want to jump on top of them like big time wrestling off the rope, like Hulk Hogan. One, two, three, and you're out, and I'm the champion. Now what the hell is? And I know people listen. Oh, Vermilion no Codger. Yeah, you line your guys up, and I line mine up. And when the dust clears, you can be doing the Turkish get up. We're going to be going this way. I mean, it's hard. Oh, the core. You know what? I call the core the new whore. Because think about it, you use, I know Mark Comerford and I know the guys that did all the TA work because I spent time with them. If you want to learn something, go to the originator, not the impersonators. All those core exercises were for people that hurt their backs. Now, go someone ask, we're doing this core exercise. Why are you doing what's core? What, ver what part of the core are you, did you do a test for it? No. What part of the core 
are you evaluating? Is it a high load? Like lifting, running, jumping things, sports activities? Is it low load? Or is it the intrinsic muscles like the TA and the multifidus? So you, if, you, if you're testing, if you're using the core, you better know what you're using them for. But they were designed for people that were hurt. And I, a Dr. Nesser, I believe out of Southwest Missouri or one of those did a study, and he found the squat much better than a plank. And he made re real sim simple because you're standing. There's nothing wrong with the plank as an elementary exercise. But, you know, it's like we just, we like, I'm going to stand up here. It's like we just discovered this part of our body right here. Every time you squat, jump, run, lift, sprint, throw a medicine ball, you're using that. You're developing it, but we've got, you know, oh, we're doing our core. Oh, the, the guy just squatted 400. You don't think he was working his core? So I, I just think we get off in these uh, fool around, ex and I, I look at the turkey, yeah, it's a hard exercise. You know, I, I look at the, that bridge thing, what do they call it, the hip lift or something? Yeah, and yeah, I, the bridge. And I, I see the dumbbell swing, that's not new, and nothing's new. The only thing I tell young coaches, the only thing that's new is you. And the only reason it's new is you just haven't experienced it yet. But, and uh, Bob Aleo, who you have all the time, made a great statement. Tell me what it is, and I'll tell you what we used to call it. I mean, I, I've seen pictures in the 1800s of a guy doing an in-depth jump from Dr. Ed. I can't – I always want to call him Edgar the Racing Car. And that, that's my name for him. I can't think of him. Dr. Ed Thomas, great guy out of Iowa. So uh, it's like – the hip lift and the dumbbell swing in sports is an extension of the hip, knee, and ankle. The, the biggest problem you have in sports is you don't have enough time. So why am I going to have them do those exercises that are limited and don't extend all those muscles? Well, you're not working the hips. Hey, you squat, you're clean, you're working the hips. You, and if you want to get more horizontal, just jump uphill because now that's more specific it's in that drive angle you want because uh, I think Derek would agree. The initial accelerations, the, the stronger, more powerful are, the longer you can stay in that drive angle. A la Charlie Francis on that tape he had of the girl running uphill. So why would, if I've got a great squat, why would I want to do the hip lift? And then some all pro gets on there and does it. And everybody thinks, well, that's what I got to do. He was all pro because he had the right mom and dad. It had nothing to do with anybody else. And he had the attitude. So you talk about, I wouldn't change. You know, it's like single leg exercises. We never used them. And I, and Angel Spaz Spazoff came to my house and stayed with me. I know him well. I was down to see him about four years ago. He wasn't doing any of them more. By the way, he wasn't doing them anymore. <laughs> I think they're fine. I would incorporate, if I wanted to do those, I would incorporate them after my bilateral work, because you're already warm, get a few in. Uh, I do not like to squat with the foot raised because it torques the pelvis. And there's guys in the internet, one guy was doing it all. You can just see his back go. I think probably single leg, the two best, or the three best I like. One was the Mike Boyle when they had him on the box. I thought Mike's where they had the dumbbells and you do a full. I thought that was a great exercise. I used to be able to do it. My my exercise selection has went from here to here. Pretty soon it's going to be getting out of bed, going to bed. Uh, then the uh, next one I like is a lunge because you have to decelerate. The foot is moving forward and you have to decelerate. The other one I like is on a box, you do a backward step up. Dragomir showed me this. And when you're really strong, you get on a box that you can't touch your bottom foot and you go all the way down and back up and drag them. Uh, but what we do for old people like me, my right knee bothers me some, so I'll get on a box and I'll just eccentrically go down with my, uh, um, my right legs on the box. And I started 12 and then I worked to 15 to 18, maybe 21, depending on how my leg feels. And that's a really good way. Rob Panarello uses it a lot, so easier on that. Patella. I think, I think all the exercises are good. It's you, you, what happens in America. We are all, someone comes out new and speaks with a new voice, uh, you know, European voice, mm, it doesn't speak good English. And then you speak to them the side, their English is better than you, yours. 
uh, and then we all jump into it. <laughs> we all, you know, Yuri Vardanian had Lance do single leg pulls. Uh, so I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but just remember, do you ever see any research? It's all done. What can they squat? And when you watch most athletic activities, even cuts in that, a lot of them happen off two legs. The other th reason I like to bilateral squat better, and here's why, two, three reasons. Number one, let's say you can, uh, let's say you weigh 100 kilos, I weigh 100 kilos. Relatively same height. I can squat bilaterally 200 kilos. You can single leg squat 100. Now let's switch training method methods and let's see who adapts first. 100 kilos on my back because the axle loading, what the, none of the single leg people understand, when you hold that bar, the, the bone density and strength through the body is different than any exercise. Now, the caveat where the back squat gets its bad name, poor coaching, poor preparation. It's gotta be a gradual prep and not everybody should do it. There's always gonna be exceptions. I didn't do it with everybody. Some people couldn't do it. So be it. Uh, the other thing is, think of the, when you go down the bilateral squat, we talked about your hips. Your hip mobility has to be much better because I trained a guy that didn't have good hip mobility. He could do the single leg squat, but you get him bilateral. A lot harder to get in that depth if those hips are not tight. The other way to strengthen the groin, the adductors, a lot more. Mm -hmm. So I, I would first do bilateral, working the single leg stuff in. I don't think it's but it's not a panacea. The back squat isn't a panacea. The Olympic lifts aren't a panacea. There's no one thing. It's what does the athlete need at that time? Where is he at? And I use that old pyramid thing I put together. If work capacity is what he needs, then 60 or 70% of the time you've cut that pie, or at least 50% is that. Well, he's not getting any stronger. Well, why do I want to get him stronger and powerful and he's, gonna, he's not in any shape and he's going to break down in training? Right. So yeah. it just, uh, you know, and this, and coach this, I mean, I, I want to, we have to wrap up pretty quick, oh, uh, but, yeah. but does this change for like the sport of golf? Like you guys can both speak to this, but okay. let me, let me answer that this way. Yeah. For most team sports, the only thing that changes is the ball, the surface and the uniform. What you need now in all team sports, you need rapid acceleration. Then how far you need to accelerate depends on the game. Mm -hmm. Now, golf is a little different. Chuck Cook and I started doing golf back in 1982, 83. He came to see me at the 49ers. And I met, I had actually met Chuck back when I was coaching with the Niners. Jim, the late Jim Fripp gave me a lesson. Great guy, Jim was. And Chuck said, what can you do for golf? And I said, you guys don't move. And, uh, but we started throwing the medicine ball and doing things. And, you know, and everybody says golf, grip a golf club like a, like a, a feather. Sam Sneed could grip, his grip strength was 80 kilos. So when he said it was like a feather, he was still putting a lot on there. But if you've got a guy like me where I can only grip about, uh, I don't know how many kilos, 35, probably, okay, 35, so about 37 kilos in my left hand. I've got to grip it tighter. And if you've got a woman who can only grip 40 pounds, and you tell her like a feather, swing it. So uh, you got to be careful. Uh, and you know, what they don't realize about Sneed and Nicholas, we're both great athletes. And what they're seeing today, I just heard Hank Haney talking about, he was with Dustin Johnson. And Tiger and him had talked when they were working together, someday there's going to be big, strong guys coming to play. And I think the thing with a golfer, one of the most important things I do with young kids, once they were, could sprint adequately and had adequate strength, is sprinting. Because I always told Greg, I thought sprinting really, because it's the fastest thing you can do, the muscle contraction, the intermuscular coordination, the rhythm, the fluidity, blah, blah, blah. A long drive contestant had, had lost some speed and he started playing softball and he noticed he was slower running the first base. So he went out and ran sprints and got his speed back. I know when I, in the summertime, if I run sprints, I can pick up a little speed. And so I think it's the same progression. Do they need to squat double their body weight? Like I would think for, the, I really believe in the combat of the sports. And I, when I say that, 
I say that with some guidelines. You're not going to get a guy seven foot. You know, there's a few you may, but you know, and again, it's individual. But you would like to. So I think you need to develop a certain amount of good general strength. I think doing a few Olympic lifts from the mid thigh, the medicine ball throws. And they're young, train them like you would train any other athlete. Once they get to a certain level, then you've got to maintain those qualities. Right. And I, th I think you just, here's the other thing is I, I noticed something where they were doing these heavy sled pushes with a tremendous amount of weight. And I'm thinking, geez, you're destroying the rhythm. And, and some people say, well, Charlie was wrong because he said 10%. He was working, let's go to golf, with the Dustin Johnson's of track and field. You're not going to take a world-class sprinter and put a whole bunch of heavy weight and change that rhythm. up. You're going to screw them up. Uh, do I think young kids can, uh, I don't like the pushes, but do pull sleds from the waist with a little heavier weight? Probably. As long as it looks like sprinting and not, uh, 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 because if it's that, you might as well go in the weight room. Right. But so. it's, it, it's interesting to see, and I know, Derek, I know we have to close up, but it's interesting to see, you know, even with, I'm, I'm, I'm much more from your school of thought. You know, I believe in creating a better athlete. I, and by all means, I should be, you know, coming from a golf, back, a golf background, golf fitness background, I should be trying to pocket and categorize everything into golf fitness. I don't because I, I feel like a fraud doing it. And I just – I believe in creating a better athlete. I believe in, you know, it, it, it's – three sets of 10 of a side med ball throw going to really improve the golf swing. My assumptions, no, it, it's not. They're swinging a club 500 times a day. They already have that pattern instilled. Let's make sure they're resilient. Let's make sure they're fast. And um, it's been refreshing to see. I mean, even with TPI in the beginning, everything was with that McKay golf grip. And now you see Rob Yang Olympic snatches. It, it has changed. It has evolved, which is really refreshing. Here's the thing to remember. And I, I hope you let this go. I hope you're not like a, anyway, <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the thing is, you're dealing with a human being. All humans, athletes, need relatively somewhere near the same things, different, varying degrees. So that's what about training. Everybody wants to reinvent the wheel. I said, in the last thousand years, have human beings changed? They got a different heart, different tissue, different tendons, different legs? No. Then so why are you trying to reinvent the wheel? There are certain given principles that work. And what I see in the industry is too much cutesy. Oh, in the golf industry. And I, I, and I got a video clip of someone teaching the power clean, and I took the teacher out of the clip because I don't want to, I never want him. To, and this guy, and, it, and I wonder why the guy never got any better. It was the uh, ugliest clean I've ever seen. Big reverse curl, then he comes in the press. But you've got to look at the athlete. And, and Charlie made a great the higher level you go, everything is general except swinging that golf club. Mm -hmm. And it's the same in all sports. You know what the most specific practice is? Tournaments, games. People say, what about practice? Well, Michael Jordan, is he going to play against anybody as good as him? Well, Pippen would probably give him some. But, I mean, no. Do you have the fans? Do you have a consequences because you have a bad day? In practice, you have a bad day. You're mad at the coach. You're mad at yourself or whoever. But in a game, you have consequences because you have a W or an L after the game. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why, it, you know, the tour players, and I see them do so many things. You know, and you look at Rory's training, a little bit I looked at, it was pretty fundamentally basic and not too complicated. And But you know what? You can't sell books or DVDs if you don't give it a new name. Oh, geez. You know, that's why I say people say, do people call you? No. I said, Why? This is, I'm going to tell them the same thing I did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I just know a little bit more how to teach it. Absolutely. So I'm not going to tell them a whole lot different. Awesome. Um, well, Coach, listen, we can't thank you enough. It really is. You are a living legend. we got to say uh, that. Yeah. It's, great, man. It's, it's been great to learn from you and listen. You know, to yeah, my wife would tell you I'm living in pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that to her. Derek, thank you. Coach, thank you. It's been an honor. You're welcome. And have a great weekend, guys. Thanks, Derek. Take Bye. care, guys. Thanks, Al. 